Hi folks, welcome to the Moving Beyond Being Good podcast by Gary Ryan from Organisations That Matter. In this podcast, Gary shares everything about servant leadership, service leadership, authentic leadership, how to create high performance cultures, service excellence and life balance. Here's your host, Gary Ryan. Thank you, Sienna, for your lovely introduction. Folks, I'm very, very happy to be with a good old friend of mine, Dave King, Now, Dave King is a non-executive director of the Royals, and we're going to hear a little bit about them, and also a founder of the Royals, and he is also uh, the co-founder and CEO of Move 37, and Move 37 is going to take us to a place that we're all going to want to dive in deep to understand. Dave, welcome aboard the Moving Beyond Being Good podcast. Great to be here, Gary. I've I've watched a few episodes, so I'm uh, pumped to be uh, in the limelight, finally. (laughs) <laughs> You've been waiting to get in in, in the yeah. room. I've, I've been uh, waiting to get to speak with you, particularly because of uh, the uh, the history that you've got with your creative agency. So um, we, with the Royals, do you want to just tell us a bit about the Royals? I mean, it was started in 2008, if my mm-hmm. timing is about accurate there. So that's a good uh, coming into its 16th year. So tell us about that creative agency and, and what got that started and what that's all about. Yeah, sure. So I guess it started when I was 15. And um, I did um, a random kind of little bit of work experience at my mum's company. Mum, my mum was company secretary of um, AV Jennings. Remember the, the home people? Yes. Um, they had a, a one-person advertising department who was a guy who had like a portable classroom in the car park and smoked cigarettes all day. And he just did spray paint art and that was their advertising. So he made all these print ads and that kind of stuff. So I went and sat in his smoky smoky little um, weirdo office for, for a week. Um, but he was, he was actually a great guy and he was, he was just talking to a 15 year old. So, um, and mum said afterwards, so like, you know, I always imagine you could be in advertising, or whatever. And I, I kind of forgot about it for, you know, 20 years. Um, but I was working in corporate strategy at Census and that was my first kind of big company job. I'd always worked in internet jobs since the early nineties. Mm-hmm. Um, so I fell in love with the internet in the early 90s and, and worked at, you know, um, production companies. I worked at Rolling Stone magazine. I worked in re- reviewing video games for a living. I had some, some good gigs in the 90s. Um, but uh, this is my only large company and um, I wasn't, I didn't, I was finding I wasn't great at making things happen in a large company. I was there for a few years, I was there for four years, but the bureaucracy and the kind of you know, the um, building coalitions of the willing, all that kind of stuff to get ideas up wasn't wasn't for me. And mm-hmm. we we're working with the consultancy, we we're working with Boston Consulting Group at the time. And, and this woman goes, you probably should be in advertising. And I literally thought, I think that's what my mum said like 20 years ago. <laughs> and so I just wrote a few emails and, and got a job um, at a digital agency in Paran, um, which was bought by Cleminger Group, which is a big network of agencies. And again, I lasted three months at Cleminger and thought, no, this big, this big company thing is, is not great. But also that was in 2008 and they were a bit behind on the internet thing. And I'd, like I said, I've worked on the internet you know, for sort of 16 years before that. And they were still making lots of catalogs and outdoor ads and that kind of stuff. And the chairman took me to lunch and he said, well, you know, how do we get you to stay? Like, what would you do differently? And I said, I wouldn't do anything differently. You're printing money, but it's just not for me. Like, yes. it's not, there's nothing innovative, interesting, progressive. It's all you know, 1950s kind of ad stuff. But, you know, to their credit, they were making um, a mozza out of it. Mm. So I thought I can do this and I want to do it my way. Um, so I took I took one client with me, a, a fantastic guy named Ed Smith, who's now um, CMO of Amazon Europe. Wow. Um, he's a great guy and he's kind of mentored me in a few different ways along the years. Um, and he came across as a client and that was News Corp. Um, so I did a stack of work for News Corp at the start. So I started the Royals... 2008, as you said, um, and the and the vision was to have a, an interesting creative agency, um, more involved in emerging media, sort of creative technology, those kind of things, um, and did that for a few years, and then realised, and I was kind of a strategy guy. My role in in ad, in ad, ad agencies, there's kind of a there's the suits, the account people who generally sort of bring in the business and manage the business, manage the clients. There's the strategy guys and and girls who folks who who create the strategies insights and then brief the creatives to come up with the ideas and then there's production people i was kind of a strategy guy but i didn't really have a um uh, a creative director in the business so i reached out to this guy um who was uh, done some work with and he said i'm already talking to these other people so in 2011 brought on three other partners um and it's fantastic we did a lot of interesting work um great clients mercedes-benz spotify 
did an, an election campaign with the Australian Labor Party. The federal election campaign was one of my favourites. Um, and yeah, worked in that business for 10 years. So it was, it was a great experience. And of course, throughout that period, you, uh, you had your son, he came along, uh, in fact, before you started the Royals as well. So mm -hmm. there's some courage in making that decision to, to get out of the big organization into going your own pathway, there's some courage required there. Can you tell us about the, the decision-making around the courage? So we understand the part about, I, I, I just there was nothing wrong with the big the big corporate. It's just yeah. that it wasn't for me because I wasn't um, getting to use my creative juices and innovation that you mentioned, Dave. But at the same time, there is that financial reality of going out on your own. So yeah. a lot of the audience are interested about how, how do people like you make that call, especially when you've got a young son at the time. Yeah, I can remember. I can remember that really specifically because the reason. So in two thousand and two thousand and one. I guess I was, me and my partner at the time were both made redundant from this dot-com startup. So the dot-com crash happened. Yes. Um, you know, we had lots of options in this company which became worthless overnight, um, which was a great experience. And we made, got made redundant and then thought, oh, well, we're going to get other work eventually. Um, so we spent all the money on a trip to Thailand. That was quite fun. Um, not all of it. And then I tried to kind of do... Um, kind of freelance consulting and web, web web design and that kind of stuff. I just didn't have the network. So, and then when Milo was being born in 2002, that's when I thought, oh, shit, I need to get a job. I need to get a full-time job. So that first um, corporate strategy job was when Milo was born. So I went on paternity leave the week after I started that job. So that was very much in, I need to, you know, lay some ground for secure, you know, employment and income. And then you're right. And four years later, I was paid pretty well. Um, but I was, I, it was such a strange experience. I was stressed when I came home because I was so underutilized. Mm. And I've never experienced that since, and I hadn't experienced it before. It's this real tension between kind of going, I feel like I'm a success because I'm paid well, but I have no, like virtually zero self-fulfillment from a yeah. work perspective. Um, and so in the end, I had to take a pay hit, which is a, which is a strange thing, to, I, I think, to go backwards, but you know, everybody around me said, you got to do that to go forwards. And it definitely paid off. Yes. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a very strange emotional um, context at that time, because, you know, a lot of my, a lot of my sort of peers were sort of still just gradually climbing up and, you know, and, and to be honest, a lot of my um, colleagues weren't enjoying their work either. They just didn't really see a way out. So yeah. I was pretty quickly happy with that decision. Um, and, yeah, and then when the when I when I went from uh, Cleminger to start the Royals, in a way it was a bit easy because I dragged that client over. So you yes. know I managed to, and that was the um, that was the trust that Ed, um, the guy I mentioned, had in me. Um, and so I kind of had the same pay straight away, um, yes. which was a great base to build an agency off. And that's and that's a bit lucky, um, but also um, mm. you know strategic. Oh yeah, it's not. Uh, I'm not. I won't delve, delve into the same story. But but I had a similar experience in starting organisations that matter. Um, when when Monash University stopped the organisation I was part of, and everyone that we'd started this by accident, a consulting business that I was doing the consulting, um, I went to all the uh, clients that we had, including those internal to Monash, and said, "Hey, I'm going to start my own business. Would you keep? Would you come across? I'm not going to be Monash. I'll be organisations that matter." Um, will you come? And hundred percent of them said yes. So I actually knew I had a business to get started with, and yeah. you know, so similar sort of experience there. But it's there's a degree of luck, but it's all the hard work that went in first to make sure that you were delivering for those clients. And in your case, that first client who was more than happy to come across for you, so you knew you had a business. Like, right? and and yeah. you know, this is it's still courageous though because you're not guaranteed of that client forever. <laughs> like the things can happen in the world that to change that so we then get to 2017 and move 37 comes along tell us mm -hmm. about move 37 and why it's called move 37 yeah sure so it was it was 10 years um in fact tamara my partner when she when she heard i was talking about this call gave me this letter have a listen to this so this is a letter from my business partner andrew sifka on our 10-year anniversary because dear david Happy birthday to us. As we reach this 10 year milestone, I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for taking the leap 10 years ago. Thanking you for inspiring me like few others. Thanking you for pushing me 
to think more, question more, and consider more. Thank you for never switching off and always looking for more. Thank you for being our X Factor. Thank you for losing to me at table tennis and pool a lot. Thank you for being my friend. Here's to the next 10. And so that that was like, he's an incredibly, as you can hear, like emotionally intelligent guy and, yes. and it's very in touch with his feelings and, and, um, and how that relates to business. Um, that 10 years felt like a, a great solid kind of chunk of time. Um, and I was, I was starting to really get into artificial intelligence. I've always been a bit of a nerd. Um, and in fact, you know, in the nineties started sort of making, learning to make HTML pages. And that was my first job kind of in, um, in technology after graduating, uh, and then realized quickly, I don't want to be the maker of those. I'll, I'll work with the team. Someone, someone else can do that. But when artificial intelligence sort of came out of its winter, artificial intelligence has been heavily invested in on and off since the 50s. So it goes through these phases where um, there's a lot of hype, a lot of interest, a lot of investment, a lot of research and development. And then traditionally it's been quite disappointing. And so the investment kind of dries up and it goes into what's called an AI winter. Um, hmm. And then this time, basically about 2016, 17, it was kind of coming out of an AI winter. And that's because there had been some fairly significant kind of progress in um, sort of models, AI models. Also the bandwidth available on the internet um, allowed you to kind of do more interesting things. The storage, the cloud compute, you know, cloud computing, all that kind of stuff came, came together. The hardware, um, you know, the chips that sort of um, are able to help train AI models and generate images and all those kind of things. So there's probably three or four factors that came together in about that time frame. Um, and I was looking around the agency and in creative agencies, in ad agencies, you know, literally since the 50s, copywriters and art directors work together in tandem. Um, mm. So I kind of, and I've always wondered about that. I thought it feels a bit indulgent. Like it's probably only one of the, everyone would like a wingman. Like I would love to have like a, you know, a mate sitting beside me working all day, like just doing one job together. That, that sounds like a lot of fun, but no one gets one or hardly anyone gets one. And as a business owner, um, and this might sound a bit, you know, capitalistic, but I looked around and thought, imagine each of these people had an AI thought partner for work, um, you know, mainly because most people don't get one, but also, you know, we'd create more output, more ideas. Um, and that started Move 37. So the name Move 37 comes from something I was watching on TV at the time. So in 2016, um, Lee Sedol, South Korean guy, um, was the world champion of the game Go, which is a board game, ancient Ch Chinese board game called um, Go. It's much more complex than chess, but in AI, you know, there's kind of these challenges and competitions that come up every now and then to test the um, the capability of AI. And, and the, the most significant one before that, or the most public one, was when IBM's computer um, beat Kasparov in chess. Yes. And that was, and that was a, a moment, like the, the fact that you're kind of nodding along and possibly most of your audience would know about this, if you think about how many chess games you know about, um, then that's probably one of the main ones. And, mm -hmm. and that's because as humans, we've always been fascinated since the industrial age about automation and augmentation of our own capabilities and when, when are we going to be able to make things that surpass us? So those kind of tests, those kind of moments in time are really interesting cultural moments. So back to South Korea. So Lee Sedol was challenged in the game of Go um, by Google. So Google DeepMind had made a machine called AlphaGo, um, basically a model that was trained in a very new way to learn the game of Go. It learned the game of Go without any rules, it all just by play. So just by, it's called reinforcement learning, unsupervised reinforcement learning. It just tries stuff and tries and tries and tries and learns the rules just by trying. Um, right. And so it became very good at, and it doesn't need supervision um, as the sort of unsupervised bit um, suggests. So it can just kind of run by itself, you know, overnight continually. And the more cycles and the more games, I don't know how many games are played, but it would have been millions. Um, it learns what works. And, and that's a model that when DeepMind created that, they didn't create that because they wanted to be really good at Go. They created it to test the boundaries of this kind of um, uh, AI model. Mm. So, so DeepMind AlphaGo came up against Lisa Dole in a seven match um, series. Um, the most watched thing in South Korea, 20 million people dialed into it. Um, and Lee Sedol won the first game easily in a, in a canter. And the, and the, the, the deep mind engineers, there's a great Netflix show um, about this called AlphaGo. Um, and it's a very human story. It's not a technology story. Um, 
Lee Sedol had uh, won the first game. The, the Deep Mind engineers overnight sort of made some tweaks and that kind of thing. Um, and it, they, they helped it learn how Lee Sedol played because it had never played against him. It had played sort of fictional games, you know. The second game was a bit closer and it was in the third game and the 37th move, move 37, where the machine, the machine did something that, the, that basically stopped the AI world in its tracks. So it played this, it played this move um, that Lisa Dole thought um, it was broken and, you know, you know, it's, 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 you know, looked at it kind of puzzled and thought what, what's happened there. And then he kind of had a little bit of a moment, got up and walked out. And the two commentators are looking, going, what's just happened? There must be something wrong. And they said, I think the machine's made a mistake. And then they looked at it more closely and said, no, that's incredible. We've never seen a move like that. And they described it as a, a creative move, a human-like move, something a human wouldn't have done. And the and Deep Minds Alpha Go went on to win all the rest of the game. So everything changed in that move. So for me, coming from the creative agency world, hearing them describe, and creativity is obviously something that humans hold close to their chest is something that's very human. Like yes. you, don't think of, you don't think of your car or your sewing machine or, you know, using Photoshop. You don't think of the software as creative. You're the creative one. Yes for Success, How to Achieve Life Harmony and Fulfillment is my new book. It's out now. Check out the link in the show notes for all the details of how to get the new book, Yes for Success, How to Achieve Life Harmony and Fulfillment. It's going to teach you a whole heap of strategies around how to have increased happiness now and into the future for your life. If not for you, get it for someone else that might be struggling or floating along in life. This book works. And as you can see, folks, the book debuted at number six on Amazon. So people have reacted to it very positively. Check it out. You can get your copy too. Now let's return to our interview with Dave King. Um, yes. And so for have, to have an AI model suggest something where people who know the game really closely describe that as creative, like made me sit up and take notice. And I thought no one was doing I really couldn't find anyone doing anything with AI and creativity. So certainly not in advertising and marketing. There were people experimenting with things like, you know, generating images that are pretty poor quality, kind of bad poems, all that kind of stuff, but not applying it to creative industries. And so I set off on that path to make a company that would leverage what the breakthroughs had been having in AI and apply them to sort of creative and critical thinking. That you gave me goosebumps with that, that story. Yeah, great. Like, uh, that is that is uh you know i knew nothing about that game go um and for you to i love it when people have the story and i always believe there is a story behind the organization name but as soon as you started explaining about the games i went i bet you it's move back <laughs> number 37 which has changed everything and and it's as it turns out and you described that just beautifully dave and so now that's coming up to well, 2016 when you saw that. You formed Move 37 in 2017, if mm -hmm. uh, I've got that data accurate. And we're now just about to roll into 2024. Now, from someone like myself that sat outside all this world, it's, I've described the um, evolution of AI in 2023 like the evolution of the internet in 1993. I know that the internet pre-existed 1993, but for me and a lot of people of my generation, 1993 was the year we remember the internet really happening and people started to get email and people started to get their computers. And I think it was 1994 when I got my first computer in my in my job and mm -hmm. you, know, you could search the internet and, and all of that sort of stuff around that sort of period. And then in 2023, particularly because of ChatGPT, and people's uh, use of that at the moment, um, it's really put the spotlight on, on the use of AI. But ch And I think a lot of people think that AI is ChatGPT. Mm -hmm. ChatGPT is just one form of many forms of AI, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, I, but I think this will be, 2023 will be the marker of, of a lot of people's memory. For you, the memory is much earlier, but the marker of, hey, that's when AI come along. That said, from my limited understanding, AI is going to make the introduction of the of the internet look like a kindergarten party. Like I think it's going to be unbelievably awesome, and I think potentially it could be unbelievably terrible at the same time. Mm -hmm. Right, and particularly for human beings who choose not to adopt a growth mindset, 
choose to not be curious, choose to not be in control of their learning, choose to distance themselves from the evolution of AI. Mm -hmm. I think I think AI will actually be very bad for those people, mm -hmm. potentially in terms of employment and stuff like that. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I am an advocate. So I'm saying embrace it because whether you choose to embrace it or not, it's it's here. It's not coming. It's here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just going to exponentially have an exponential impact over time. So um, is that in any way, shape or form accurate? Because that's just my, yeah, my perspective. I think, I definitely it is. I think um, I haven't seen yet. Yeah, the, the analogy at the start of the internet is a good one because there was a moment around that time, 93, 94, where the first graphical browser came out. So Netscape created a browser called Mosaic. Yes. Um, and then Netscape sort of created the browser called Netscape and then Microsoft, you know, Bill Gates had said the internet's a fad and then quickly changed his mind a few years later. Uh, well, not quickly, but changed his mind a few years later. Um, and notoriously got taken to court for saying smash Netscape, which was anti-competitive language and he should, never should have emailed his staff saying that. Um, but you're right, that moment, so the, the graphical browser was a gateway into technology that already exists. And, and for, for normal people, you need something that's easy to use um, and gives you a lens into what the technology can do. And that was like the Netscape, the browser, because before that it was, you know, text only. It was hard to kind of download images and compile them and all that kind of stuff. So the ChatGPT moment was significant in a bunch of different ways. Um, so when the, the company behind ChatGPT is called OpenAI and OpenAI have had a bunch of different models, ChatGPT one, two, three, around for a few years. Uh, and we've been using them in, in Move 37. We've been using them. Um, our company mainly works with language. We don't do, you know, imagery or financial data or anything like that. It's all about words. Um, so we've been using a bunch of these models for a few years. No one expected the ChatGPT explosion to happen, not even the internal people at OpenAI. Right. And so when, when, they, when they roll out that experience, and like I say, it's just one of many experiences, it's a chat interface, which people are familiar with um, because they chat with friends in WhatsApp or whatever. Um, but they did a deal with uh, Microsoft. OpenAI did a deal with Microsoft. Microsoft spent $14 billion to buy not, not quite half the company. And what that provided OpenAI was incredible cloud infrastructure so yes. that when people use ChatGPT, it has almost magical speed. It's incredible. Yes. Like just to think the, the inference, the generation of that text is happening on the fly. It's hard to believe. Yes. Um, and we've seen this behind the scenes over the last few years. We can generate stuff and do stuff, but it's never been that quick. It's phenomenal. Um, so for us, oh look, for people, I think people had a, it's, it's, you have to use it. And I think something you said rings true. You have to get in and play and experiment. And mm. if your work's not doing it or telling you to do it, do it on your own time, because there's a saying going around and I kind of believe this, and this is maybe one of the dark sides of AI. Um, but then you're not going to lose your job to AI. You're going to lose your job to someone who's really good at using AI. Um, yes. You know, when, when Kasparov uh, lost to Deep Blue, he didn't throw his toys out of the cot. He went and created a thing called um, Advanced Chess or Centaur Chess. And Centaur Chess is basically proved that human and machine can beat either human or machine. Yes. Which is really interesting. So if you think about why should a human using AI be better than an AI, there's a lot of reasons because machines and humans are better at different things. And if we can work out the interface to you know, bring them together, and it's not going to be chat, it's going to be other things. It's going to be a phenomenal um, growth in our capabilities as knowledge workers. Uh, so if you can make the most of your own gut instinct, feelings, intuition, um, experience, emotions, if you can make the most of that and translate that into and communicate your ideas to the AI, then the AI can step in and kind of go, it's really good at remembering stuff, recall, search, um, generation. It's surprisingly good at weird stuff like analogies and metaphors. And those, those are things that we've kind of, and reasoning, it's not quite there, but getting there. Those are things we thought were very human traits just, just two years ago. And we've seen evidence that these large language models can do it much better than us. They can take two ideas and combine them in seconds and go, holy crap, that's incredible. Um, so there are some things that are coming out of these large language models that even the developers are surprised at. Um, for example, and this is interesting, if you work in the space, you need to keep on the research all the time. Someone did a research piece at a university a couple of weeks ago or published it a couple of weeks ago. And it said that when you prompt ChatGPT or any other AI model, prompting is just, you know, stuff where you type yes. it in. Yes. If, if you add, it's very important to get this right. It means a lot for my career, um, my future's with you. If you, if you. if you use these kind of phrases, it performs 10% better. 
Oh. And that, that's really weird. Large language models are weird, and that's something I keep saying and hearing because these quirks, all of the – they're trained on lots and lots of human words, and they've seen lots and lots of different expressions and reactions to those expressions. So they do adopt – just accidentally, some kind of human behaviours. Another one is if you offer us a tip, if you offer to tip it, there's a tip in for this. If, if you do a good job, there's a tip in this for you. <laughs> <laughs> I admit, I, 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 I had been using ChatGPT quite a bit and uh, I would rarely do a prompt with less than 600 words now. Yeah, yeah, good. And, and it's a conversation, right? Yeah. And it's uh, and telling it about when it exhausts its tokens that it needs to tell me to please yeah, continue. All that sort of stuff. Um, guy called uh, Dave Burse, I did his course on LinkedIn Learning, actually, and it was uh, exceptional. I'm yeah, fantastic. To... Now, t- so folks that are listening, what does Move Thirty Seven do? Like, for you know, plug your business right now. Like, what yeah, if folks yeah. listening and they're interested? What what would Move Thirty Seven do for folk listening in? Look, it's a good segue from the chat team moment because what we've been working on for the last few years was a product, and that product is called Archer, and it's AI yes. research assistant. And we've been testing it with a number of different sort of clients over the last, we did a lot of R&D. So that timeline is quite long because we did a stack of R&D at the start um, and took our time to do things properly. And it was, you know, we tried some things that didn't work, tried some things that did work um, and took advantage of the R&D tax incentive in Australia by doing real R&D um, and then released Archer iteratively over probably two years, a year and a half, two years and tested a lot. And basically we we're getting it to a point where it could understand masses of text. It can understand patterns and trends. Um, it does automatic thematic analysis of like masses of text. So whether it's PDFs or emails or business plans or web pages, it can ingest them, analyze them and sort of show you patterns. So for example, we've got a, a customer, um, South Australian education department, uh, and they use it to understand reports about schools, not, not school, uh, not student reports, but reports yes. about the schools. Sure. Um, and, and it gives them a whole different way of seeing what's in this text. A human could never go through and do that. So what happened with ChatGPT when it came along is it really messed with the trajectory of a lot of startups, especially people who are making products, including us. Right. So what happened was people using ChatGPT suddenly go, hang on, this is fantastic. And they, and they just like you, they might've done a course or experimented. So all of these people that have been building products on the back of OpenAI's technology, OpenAI came along and competed with those startups. Oh, by saying, yeah. No one saw that coming. No one thought, you know, imagine like a wholesaler of fruit and veg kind of suddenly opening a shop kind of going, well, we're going to, we're going to sell at half the cost of Coles um, and, and still have Coles as a customer. It's really tricky to kind of go and the developers are still using it. So anyway, the long story short is we're still making Archer, but the ChatGPT moment drove us into consulting. We had so many people knocking down our door to say, what do we do with this? I've played with ChatGPT. Yes. So this year we've had a stack of interesting, um, clients in the consulting space. And basically what they're doing is they've played with it. Then they start to look around their organization and sort of say, what can AI do for our, our team or organization? So we're designing workflows, we're designing tools, we're designing processes. Um, you, you shouldn't really be using chat GPT for, you know, private things, secure data. It's not hundred percent secure, um, but the technology behind it is good. So we build these sort of custom interfaces and we're basically looking to enhance people's productivity. Uh, we talk about gain points and pain points. So the, the pain points are often quite easy to understand. It's like something that's inefficient. Um, you know, we had a project in government, which was like, yeah, they've got to, they've got to make all these reports for the minister and not even convinced the minister reads them. Um, but if they get, if they go in front of a Senate's um, committee hearing, they have to have the answers. They have to have the reports just in case. So um, we did a really neat prototype, which generates those reports from all these other PDFs and PowerPoints and that kind of thing. So large language models have really got summarization, um, pull, pulling out highlights, thematic analysis, that kind of stuff. So it's actually a really good um, sort of capability in the reporting space. And we've got other things around content generation for a publisher. And so what we're finding, and this is this is aligned with what you said, you know, people are going to use it for good and there's, there's a bunch of different watchouts. The watchouts from a society point of view are probably more, it's less about sort of Skynet and robots, you know, coming for us or self-actualizing or, you know, magically... Um, getting free will overnight. But what is more worrying is the disruption of labor and and industry. Um, An example of that is the Hollywood writers strike. So that's the longest, longest strike they've been on. This is, I'm I'm not saying that AI was the main thing, but it was certainly part of it. What had happened was the studios were using 
uh, ChatGPT and other AI tools to generate a pretty average script and then giving it to the writers to edit it to make it better. The okay. problem is an editor gets paid less than a writer. So they basically cut out the writing task, the creative task, and then made that writer move over here down the pipeline and work for less. And so, mm -hmm. you know, this is where unions are really useful to stick up for your rights because, <laughs> you know, if capitalism's let run free, you kind of go, well, we'll make as much sort of you know, money as we want. So there's, okay. there's kind of a concerning thing about obviously who's going to lose their jobs, but what's the quality of jobs like? And, you know, some people think there's going to be less junior jobs because the junior job is kind of what AI can do quite well. Like if you use ChatGPT to generate sort of blog post titles or whatever, you kind of go, well, they're all right. They're not great. It's, e it's very easy to get okay stuff, which is like graduate work. So it's a bit concerning kind of going, where are the kids coming out of uni? How are they going to get experience in law or in journalism or in advertising when these kind of roles, these tasks are pretty easily done by AI is, is, is one thing to worry about. Yes. And, um, as you said, though, you, you said human and machine can beat human or machine. Yeah, and that's it's not evenly distributed across every single sort of task you can imagine. Um, there's a guy worth following on LinkedIn and Twitter named Ethan Mollick, and he's an educator, and he's really good at kind of going through. He's, he's written a paper or a piece called The Jagged Frontier, and what The Jagged Frontier talks about is it's not all the things that AI can do and humans can do with AI – um, some of them are surprising and some of them are, are quite deficient. So it's kind of like it's uneven. Mm. So it's kind of a watching brief. And, and they did a big study with Boston Consulting Group. And they basically, they used a thousand employees across this test. And so it showed the very average employees became better. The super high talented ones didn't really have much of a, a benefit from it. But in general, it dragged people into the middle of a much more productive but not across all tasks. So human and machine, in theory, human and machine can beat human or machine in a lot of different tasks, but not all of them. Mm. With your research, and your, your answer might be no to this, Dave, so that's just a, a flag. Um, during the year, Gallup released its uh, annual report on the state of the workplace, and globally the report revealed that engagement in the workplace is sitting at 23%, which, which was actually a record, as sad as that sounds. Yeah. Australia was 22%. And in both the global and Australian reports, we had the middle number of people who are sort of quite quitters at work as 67% uh, around that sort of figure. Uh, and the rest are actually actively disengaged in the workplace, meaning they are actually doing things to harm the productivity of the organisation. Is there anything that you've come across uh, through your exposure to AI that, that you think would actually, you know how you just went through that example, it's raising the performance of the ones at the bottom, yeah. not necessarily making the top any better, but it is impacting to some degree the ones in the middle. Is there anything about how it's helping people get more engaged in their workplace? Because that would be a great benefit if it, if it does exist. And again, you, you, that you might not have come across anything like that. I yet. think so. I know, I definitely think so. I think when we started Move 37, I kind of did a bit of research and survey amongst you know, creative teams, um, thinking about what kind of tool they would like, but also the likelihood of adoption. And it's really hard. It's really hard for people to imagine a future. Like we haven't built it, we haven't designed it. So I'm gonna ask you a hypothetical question. So, you know, it's pretty bad science as far as like researching, but um, what I found that some people, and you would have found this in your work, some people are, you know, basically predisposed to lean into trying new things. Um, and I think in general, that's a personality trait. It's not like a seniority trait. You get no. very senior people who are stuck in their ways, but others who are super keen on, you know, trying stuff. So for the people who want to try stuff, it's super interesting and liberating. And I've seen um, a range of different tools give that kind of sense of empowerment that people might have lost. Or there's this whole thing, like when you start something, I've, I've you know, talked to my son about this. It's really hard when you start to learn something because say, for example, making music or painting, because you already appreciate musical painting, but your skills um, are so poor that it's really frustrating because you go, I know what I want, I just can't get there. And you've got to push through that. You've got to learn, you've got to practice. Oh, yes, 100%. Um, yeah, and that's, and that's tricky. A lot of people give up on those kind of things because they're disappointed in themselves, but, but the reality is like everyone's terrible when they start. Yeah. Um, so it's the same with these tools, but what happens is it can kind of accelerate your feeling of – um, being creative because the because the outputs say using image generation stuff like Mid Journey, 
um, or Dali, you can describe something and then you can tweak the style and it's very satisfying. It's, it's, a, it's a really satisfying way to work. And I think, you know, when people ask me what kind of skills do we need to teach our, our kids to work with these tools, there's two things, there's two ways to answer that I see is they've got to be able to communicate what's in their head. So communication skills, critical thinking, um, definitely media literacy and understanding the algorithms they're working with and consuming. But they've got to be able to, the people who can communicate what's in their head are going to be able to create incredible things. Yeah. Um, and that still requires life experience. It still requires going out and, you know, experiencing the sunlight and smelling flowers and, and tasting things. So there's the one, one of the reasons I don't think AGI, like general intelligence, is coming as fast as some people do is because our understanding of the world is so dependent on all those senses. Like, yes. you know, an AI cannot understand. It can pretend to understand. It can imitate understanding. It can't understand what it's like to touch a hot plate or have its heart broken or feel nostalgic for, you know, a, a moment in, car, uh, in, in in a childhood. I had someone saying, what's, I said in a workshop recently, what's the, what's the, the moment in your childhood that brings you almost tears or, or makes you nostalgic? And this guy said, straight away, I used to wash my car with my dad. And yeah. his dad's gone now, but it was a ritual that they loved. And, and he could yes. describe the sunshine. He could describe the, the heat coming out yes. of the Holden Premier. He could describe, you know, the sudsiness, the, the sponge fights, whatever. <laughs> You can't get that from an AI, and if it does, no. you know philosophically it's just making it up because it's read, yes. it's, it's heard other people say it. Um, yeah. So yeah. It, it can't feel. Um, so I guess my answer to you know generally, I think it can make people really re-engage with their work because their capabilities are enhanced, and that's kind of fun and exciting. Yes, yes, yes. And as you said earlier, um, even if your workplace isn't getting you to use it. Use it anyway. Go, yeah. you, you use it in your own time because it's going to enhance your performance. It's going to make you more valuable, which, which in itself is going to create opportunities. Now, there's nothing unethical about that, and I think some people out there are thinking, "Oh, if I went and used AI to help me do to help me be better at my job against whatever a successful job looks like, then why wouldn't you use it?" Now, if someone said, "Are you using AI?" you should say yes. Yeah, and. I I've learned how to use it. You should be, that's the ethical part of it. Um, unless, of course, your your organisation says, no, we don't want to use it for whatever reasons, if they've got policies along those lines, which possibly some organisations do, and, and I suspect they will change over time. You did, you know, mention before about uh, data privacy and those sorts of things, so you I would, you wouldn't be using it for any personal data type, type mm -hmm. situations. Um Dave, it's been an incredible chat. I can imagine I'm going to be getting you back middle of, of 2024 to give us a little bit of an update on this. Um, what are some of the best ways that folk listening or watching us on YouTube could contact you for either the Royals and the creative agency side of the business and or for Move 37 and in particular the consulting work you're doing to help people with uh, chat GPT and other forms of AI, including Archer? Yeah, great. Um, hit me up on LinkedIn. I'm Dave King, and I've got. I'm sitting in a cap in front of a bookshelf. Um, there's a lot of Dave Kings in the world. I've been on a plane with three others once. So um, uh, I'm on Twitter at Dave King, and move37.ai is a great way to read about what we're doing. Um, so that web address is move37.ai. There's an email or a contact form there. You can reach out. Um, and yeah, I'd encourage your, your viewers and your listeners to kind of think about the role it's going to play in their work. Um, and it's not easy to imagine. And so we help people imagine that for their teams or organisations. Mm. Um, and like you said, get in and play and explore because some of the concepts are really hard to just describe. You've got to get in and try it. And, and people who are trying it, like yourself, doing a course, whatever, um, are finding out that they're progressing and understanding much more than they could if they just read about it. And it's, it, there's so many new kind of ideas in using AI that you really need to get in and have a shot. Yeah, you got to roll your sleeves up. And as you say, I mean, one of the beauties of having you as a consultant or coach, even, is that you can you can you can cut down the time it takes people to be competent, mm. and that that value is huge. I know with my own coaching with people is I'm able to compress time for people to get them up to speed with things that if they tried on their own, they actually might not even get to if they, if they were left on their own devices. And and we are in this world where you do need to have, I call it your personal success team, um, you do need to have folk that you're recruiting into your life to help you be the best you can be in whatever you're trying to do. And particularly in this space, you know, we get people to hit you up. Now it's move3737.ai mm -hmm. is the 
is the website, not written out 37 folks. So we will have that written in uh, underneath, Dave, for the YouTube version. But those listening in, it is move37.ai. Uh, you'll see that in all the show notes. Dave, I really want to say, say thank you at this time of the year for giving up your time. This this uh, episode will be released early in 2024, but we are actually recording this pretty much on the eve of Christmas. So we've done really well for Dave to be available to have this conversation with this afternoon. Thank you very much, mate. No, it's been great to chat. So, folks, once again, you're aware that I have released my book, Yes for Success, How to Achieve Life, Harmony and Fulfillment, just recently. Get your copy through yesforsuccess.guru. Thanks for tuning in to the Moving Beyond Being Good podcast. I'm Gary Ryan, your host. You know that we would love for you to go and give us a review on the podcast. Check us out on the YouTube channel. Of course, if you want to reach out to us at Organizations That Matter, you can reach me at orgsthatmatter.com forward newsletter. And of course, we look forward to working with you again on our next episode. Bye.